I call your attention to your sermon notes. Uh, that's an insert in your playbill. And those are the notes that I sketched uh, during the week. And you're welcome to add your notes or your drawings. So welcome to God's Way in Broadway. Uh, this is a different way to actually approach the scriptures and also find uh, the ways of God uh, in, 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 in both in what I call the intersection of scriptures and Broadway culture. Now we'll be covering things about hope and, and, and faith and purpose and change and love uh, as we look at these iconic uh, Broadway shows. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest, uh, this is the second time I have this sermon series in, in my churches, but not all the churches can pull it off. You need this <laughs> right here to pull that off. And, and so I, I'm thankful for the musical ministries of St. Mark's, both at the contemporary service and at the traditional service. And they, uh, their willingness to do this uh, is inspiring and their uh, actual doing it is, is definitely uh, heart moving. Uh, now, beloved, we live in an age we are constantly confronted with a, a decision to make. Uh, we are challenged by our situations, life-altering situations that we face, and, and we don't know which way to go. We don't know what kind of decision we need to make. Well, we, we, we struggle trying to uh, go this way or that way, and, and sometimes we get paralyzed by uh, those uh, a multitude of decisions that, and options that we, we have and, and because we fear making the wrong decision. We fear uh, taking the wrong path. So it is precisely in that moment of doubt, in that paralyzing feeling, in that space of uncertainty that we hear the wisdom of God's word saying to us from Psalms 1830, as for God, his way is perfect and the Lord's word is flawless. His way is perfect, and the word of God is flawless. And I think we can all agree that God's ways are better than our ways, are better than anything else. We can also agree that sometimes we find God's ways in the most unlikely places. And I believe that at the intersection, like I said, in, of biblical teaching and Broadway culture, we can find valuable teach valuable lessons that will guide us to accept God's ways in our lives. Now, that intersection is not new. It, it, uh, last, last week, I was sharing with you about that Christian community in Rome and how that little group was in the midst of, of this huge city filled with pagan uh, culture and, and secular culture, and yet this, this little group was able to find God's way in the midst of it all. And they were helped by the, the letter that Paul wrote to them. But you need to know that Paul used cultural elements of Rome to write that letter. One of the uh, features of culture of Rome was uh, the Roman law. And the Roman law was very important, not just for the city, but the application of it all in, in the whole empire. And, and, and Paul knew that, and that's why he crafted that epistle, that letter, with legal narratives, with a legal, a legal framework, because he knew that the Christians in Rome would understand that language because that was part of the culture of the time. And so the intersection of the, of the culture of the time with, with the, the inspired word of God was what helped this Christian community find the way of God in the midst of their situations. And against all odds, this little community uh, was able to be guided by Paul and, and get to where they needed to be. So in this sermon series, we will be highlighting the scripture as a primary source for uh, finding the ways of God. And as a secondary source, we will examine some of the Broadway shows uh, and see if they give us also clues about finding the way of God in Broadway. 
Now, additionally, during this teaching season, you will get to hear some of the iconic songs of the referenced Broadway show that we'll bring to you every Sunday. And, and interesting enough, enough, the Bible says in Psalms 138, 4 and 5, may all the kings of the earth praise you, Lord, when they hear what you have decreed. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. May the kings sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. So there's that sense of singing about the ways of God that is part of the worshiping community. And so you'll get to hear a lot of songs. Also, we will get to, to sing of the ways of the Lord together. So are we ready for this exciting journey in search of God's way in Broadway? Are we ready? Well, ready or not, here we go. <laughs> Our first sermon is titled, Hope Against Hope. Now, this is a very interesting thing. The very first person that coined that phrase was none other than Paul himself. That phrase did not exist until Paul said it. And he said it precisely in his letter to the Romans, chapter 4. He says, hoping against hope, he, Abraham, believed that he would become the father of many nations. According to what was said, so shall your descendants be. Now, I believe that this phrase is both enigmatic, the hope against hope, but also encouraging. Sometimes it's confusing, but sometimes it's also motivating. Uh, in a way, this is, this is a theological virtue, but from its beginnings, the word hope was not a virtue. In, in terms of language, the, the word hope in the Greek was actually a vice. It was not a virtue, it was a vice. It was something negative. And having hope is something that is kind of toxic. And so in the Greek understanding, when somebody would mention hope, it was really not a good thing. Uh, but that, and that's why I believe uh, Paul begins uh, bringing this idea of using hope against hope. And, and also in language, I mean, even in English, when you say, well, I hope this happens tomorrow. You, this, this idea of hope is not certainty. It's like, I wish. It's a wishful thinking. And, and, and people who say, well, I hope I'll make changes in my life, you're thinking, ah, he's not going to change because he's just hoping, right? It's a wishful thinking. Now, in Spanish, uh, yo tengo la esperanza uh, de hacer algo, is uh, to have the hope of, of doing something. In Spanish, it gives you the idea of, of counting on luck or like something is being left up to chance. And, and so the, the word hope actually if we, took, if we take it from his language ba uh, roots, it's really not a, a, a positive thing. And, and so I, I think Paul understood the ambiguity of this term. So he introduced the phrase, hoping against hope, with the purpose of contrasting hope alone and hope anchored in faith. So hope alone is just a probability. Hope against hope is an assurance and a confidence on God's promises. Hope alone is based on human nature. Hope against hope is based on divine nature. And many people, even Christians, struggle to find, experience uh, this, this hope that they need in the most difficult moments of their lives. And that's where we find Ezekiel precisely at the moment of his life, which Ezekiel is one of the greatest prophets of the nation of Israel. And, and also we find on uh, Jean Valjean, uh, the fictional character in the Broadway musical Les Mis, Les, Les Mis. Uh, they, they both, uh, in, in real life and in fictional life, they experience the human drama and, and they were experiencing a sense of hopelessness. So let's talk about the prophet Ezekiel first as he searched for the hope of, that God could only provide. Let's talk about his world, his life, his ministry, his hope. Ezekiel came to ministry in the context of hardship. He was living in Babylon at the time that he was responding to the call and, and he was part of a, a second generation of people who were exiled from Jerusalem into uh, Babylon 
by King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, God used uh, this enemy of, of Israel to punish the nation of Israel. It was a disgrace for the nation that had become a, 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 a nation of dry bones, and, and there was no hope for this disgraced and disobedient and defeated nation. And that was the context in which Ezekiel came to be. And there was no hope outside God Almighty doing something different for his, for his people. Now, the life of Ezekiel was interesting because at the, at the age of 30, he responded to the ministry. He was in ministry for 22 years. And during that time, he was uh, receiving visions of God about uh, the people of Israel, about the temple, and many other uh, ways. But Ezekiel himself, uh, his life was parallel to, uh, to the years of the greatest crisis of the nation of Israel. So you see that his life was uh, also uh, witnessing what was happening around him. Now, in his ministry, Ezekiel's uh, prophetic ministry falls into two major periods. So the first time was when, when he was uh, trying to warn the people of Israel, saying, you know, we, uh, please change your ways because you're going to be destroyed. Uh, come back to God. And, and when they didn't come back to God, then uh, destruction fell upon the nation of Israel, and, and the temple was destroyed. And that's when he, the second period of his ministry happened, trying to bring prophecies and visions and messages of, of comfort and consolation to God's people, especially about the renewal and the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. Now, the hope of, of Ezekiel was for God to help his people, for, for the people of God to find the way back to God. And after the destruction of Jerusalem, Ezekiel's prophecy became a, a message of consolation. And he was fully aware that the people of God were very uh, very weak in their faith, in, 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 in their commitment to God. And, and so he began creating a, a system, a religious system based on, on moral and political and, and religious elements. Uh, he was actually credited as the father of Judaism uh, and, and the practice of the Jewish religion. And so the, the hope of Ezekiel was to bring the, the nation of Israel back to God, and also his hope was for, for God to, to find his way back to his people and, and get together with his people. Now, let's talk about Jean Valjean from Les Mis, uh, his work, his life, his good deeds, and his hope. Now, the stage for the, mis uh, the Misra uh, was set around the, the social injustice in the 19th century France. It, it is described uh, as a long-term uh, effects of the French Revolution on French society and the climax of this, uh, both maybe the novel and also the, the musical, happened at the barricades during the battle for the soul of Paris. During the life of this uh, fictional character, uh, he was an ex-convict. He, he was said to be in jail for five years, but he attempted uh, es escaping uh, several times. So, so his sentence grew up to 19 years in prison. And when he was let, uh, let go uh, to, for freedom, uh, he, he went back and stole something from a bishop that Finally, that bishop extended grace and mercy uh, and, and, and covered for his misbehavior. And, and at that moment, uh, Jean uh, Valjean, he uh, decided to, to change his life and, and, and try to redeem himself and began uh, doing great things as his good deeds, because once he opens up, opened up his heart, he, he became a testament to the redemptive power of love, mercy, and compassion. His hard work and new vision transformed a town as he became a mayor of that town, uh, which in turn, uh, uh, he, he learned about uh, philanthropy, and, and he began taking care of people, and uh, he learned about the value of love and, and, and helping others, and, and this is... Uh, an exceptional witness of somebody who, who discovered that uh, doing good for others was, was a, a very uh, powerful, powerful tool and skill. Uh, so he became a savior and a friend to a number of people who, find, who found themselves in, in danger. 
and those were part of the good deeds of, of Jean Valjean. And then uh, his hope was uh, that throughout the musical we see uh, this, this character in the search for hope. Uh, both the, the, the novel and the musical invites uh, the audience to witness that the progress in that search. Uh, he, he always hoped for redemption, and, and he did a, a lot of investment of himself uh, to, uh, to, to separate himself from his past and, and to become a, a different person. And he hoped uh, for, to progress from evil to good, from injustice to justice, from falsehood to truth, from bestiality to duty, from hell to heaven, and from nothingness to God, from hopelessness to hoping against hope. So those were the two uh, examples. The prophet Ezekiel and this fictional character, John Valjean, are providing for us very important lessons in our quest to find the ways of God for our lives. So this is the first lesson I want to share with you, that God will always speak to your hopelessness. Now just imagine, just imagine uh, what uh, the, the Bible says in Ezekiel 37.4, then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Just imagine how Ezekiel felt like weird to talk to dry bones because they're dead, they're dry, they're, there's nothing there, they don't have ears. And God is saying, talk to them, tell them something that I want them to know. And, and, and in spite of, of that physical reality, then Ezekiel addresses the dry bones on behalf of God. And, and, and because of that, I believe that God understands the dead ends that we face in our lives, that he knows about closed doors. God feels our frustrations and our desperation. When you think that nobody is listening to you in your hopeless situation, God is listening, is hearing you in your sense of being powerless in your adversity. When your hope is failing or, or, or you have come to the point of hope, of not having hope at all, God will speak to that hopelessness in your life. And when God speaks, things happen when God talks to your hopeless situation, things begin to happen. And that is exactly what happened to Ezekiel when God asked him to address the dry bones. And this is another learning. The Bible says in Ezekiel 37, 12, thus says the Lord God, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. And notice here that God is, doing, is willing to do something for somebody who he loves. He says, oh, my people, I love you so much that I know that you, uh, you're dead, that there's only dry bones left, but I'm going to do something that you're not expecting, something that you think is impossible. And I believe that when God speaks, it is as good as done. And if God says he will bring life, is because he's going to do it. He truly has the ability to speak of impossible things and in the speaking, make them possible for you. You need to hear God speaking of things that do not exist as the, as if they do exist in your life. And if you're going through that moment of hopelessness and powerlessness, and, and, and you're starting to listen, the, the voice of God is speaking to that space in your life, then begin expecting new things and powerful things that will be manifested by the power of God. That is how God deals with the impossible. Your hopeless situation is no match to the voice of God. And remember that. But God is not finished yet. Uh, once he does the impossible, he then crowns his work with this. The Bible says in Ezekiel 37, 14, I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, says the Lord. Not only God addresses the dry bones, not only God says to the dry bones, live, come back to life, but also what is life without the Spirit of God? You can have a, a life um, 
every single day, but if you're not filled with his spirit, then it's not, that's not the kind of life that will be fulfilling. And, and so God is willing to go beyond what you expected. He's not just going to give us life, but he, he's going to give us a life that is abundant, that is powerful, that is fulfill, fulfilling in the Holy Spirit. So God's way of helping us is by changing our hopeless situation, by giving us a life filled with his spirit so that we can give witness to his love and compassion. So let me tell you one more thing about God's ways. God will give us all the kind of hope that will inspire us to sing to him every day. Beloved, for us, Hope is not a, a delusion or, or, or dangerous passion because it is grounded in faith. That's why we call it hope against hope. As Christians, we hope against the hopes of this world. As Christians, we hope even when it seems like whole, all hope is, is lost, uh, with, whether it's, 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 it's our hope for someone fighting an addiction or, or, or battling a green cancer diagnosis or struggling with some other chronic suffering. Really, for all of us, the only hope we truly have is the hope that comes from God himself as we go through the life with his, which is filled by the Spirit of God. We hope against hope, to, to lift up our praise to God one day at a time. We lift up our praise one day at a time. And because we hope against hope, we can sing to God one day more. One day more. Pray with me. Dear God, with this hope, lift up our spirits that we can sing to you one day more, that we can sing to you with our hearts filled with hope against hope that can only come from you. This we pray in your name. Amen. And every Sunday we'll give you an opportunity to respond to the word. We call this call to discipleship. Maybe this is the day that you tell God, and Jesus, come into my heart. I make you the Lord of my life. Maybe this is the day you're already Christian, but you say, God, I need to be strengthened in my walk with you. Maybe this is the day that you need to tell God, God, allow me to serve you in better ways. Maybe this is the day that uh, you want to be prepared for baptism. Or maybe this is the day that you choose to join this church as a member. Whatever your response is, do it with hope, against hope. We're going to sing one more song. And while we do that, respond to the word according to the Spirit. Let's stand.